How does one adequately begin to introduce Van Cliburn? Perhaps it would be best to let this introduction begin with Van's own words, explaining how his career began. I remember very vividly when I was three years old that my mother had been teaching this little boy. Now, I must qualify and say that she had been having him for several weeks, and he had been repeating this same little composition. But while she had never given me a lesson, she, uh, of course, knew that I would come around to listen to the other little children, and she would be teaching them. And I was very, very anxious always to hear her practice, because this was some of the great happiness for me when I would hear her practice. And she would tell me stories when I would go to bed about some of the great musicians, and especially about some of the stories that Arthur Friedheim had told her about Franz Liszt, and all of the Romantic period, and that included Schumann, Chopin, Brahms. This was an exceedingly interesting thing for me. But um, I can remember that my mother had dismissed this little boy, and I, upon waving goodbye to him at the front door, went to the piano and imitated his little piece. And it went something like this. from the kitchen. Jimmy, please go home. Your mother will be very anxious about you. And when she came in to discover I was sitting there, she says, I didn't know that you could play, and I didn't know that you were able to play. And so I said, yes, Mommy, I want to study. So she says, please, if you're intent, I want to, that you really know what you're doing. So by the time I was four, I was reading music, and then I had played a couple of preludes and fugues at Bach, and then I played first at Dodd College in Shreveport, a little recital when I was five. Van began performing for audiences at age six, and by the time of this photograph at age nine, he was experienced at public appearances. At the young age of 12, Van won a statewide competition which earned him a cash award and an appearance with the Houston Symphony. Here we see Van's parents standing behind him at the piano. They indeed stood behind him, supporting him as he pursued his musical career. What a blessing to have loving and supporting parents. The 60s found teenagers making idols of the Beatles and Rolling Stones. It was rather unusual for a classical artist to have his following of teenagers seeking his autograph. Van's followers and fans were not limited to teens. Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev was impressed with Van's height as well as with his pianistic ability. Following his 1958 triumph at the first international Tchaikovsky competition in Moscow, Van Cliburn became the first musician to ever receive a New York ticker tape parade. Van's influence and world contacts spread also to celebrities in the world of music. Here he is seen with Princess Volkansky, the daughter of Sergei Rachmaninoff. They visit Rachmaninoff's grave where he planted a small lilac bush presented to him by Moscow students. Van was congratulated by another pianist of sorts, former President Harry S. Truman, while Vice President Hubert Humphrey, Humphrey looks on. Meeting and performing for dignitaries and world leaders became usual fare for Van shown here with President Johnson, his family, and other performers at an evening of music at the White House. In July 1958, when Van arrived in Chicago for a performance at Grant Park, he realized that Kilgore, Texas would follow him around the world. This reminder of home came about when the Kilgore College Rangerettes were in town for an international harvester convention. They are shown giving him a big Texas welcome. 
His loving and devoted parents continued to follow him throughout his meteoric rise to fame, and they provided the love and emotional support needed to sustain the pressures of a heavy performance schedule. It is even more significant to be recognized by one's country and by the entire world, symbolized by this cover of Time magazine. Yet, going back to his roots, Van could never forget his excellent teachers. First and foremost, his mother, who was his only teacher until age 17, and in this picture, with his teacher at Juilliard, Madame Rosina Levine. Madame Levine guided him through many rigorous contests, launching him to the international competition. Realizing the value of good instruction, Van has always taken an interest in its aspiring young musicians. He was a regular conductor and performer at the Interlochen Music Camp in Michigan, and he is shown here with a young pianist, John Henry Oandalski. Van's interest in upcoming pianists and excellence in music is reflected in the International Piano Competition in Fort Worth, which bears his name. I would like to add one personal note. As part of this committee work, I had the unique opportunity of visiting Van and his mother at their home in Fort Worth about a month ago. How fortunate I was to experience their warmth, their graciousness, and their hospitality. And especially the charm and wit, the ever youthful zest for life that characterizes our guests. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to present our guest to you. Will you join me in welcoming Van Clyburn? I've just said to Bill Holder, and if you don't think this is going to be terribly hard to speak after that remarkable nostalgia introduction, I suppose I should be very basic about the whole thing and remind all of you that my parents and I will always, a part of us, be at 808 South Martin Street in Kilgore, Texas. As a matter of fact, I had written that so many times on documents and particularly when leaving the country and you'd sign your little papers of exit or entry and I would sign it so long, and someone remarked to me, Van, did you realize that's not really officially your home? I said, oh, well, if they don't realize that I'm still there, so they can always reach me there. I suppose it was like Miss Verna Smith. She used to forward mail to various places where we were, and she wrote once a very cute note to my mother. Dear Rildeby, I'm glad you're still here. <laughs> we were so excited, my mother and I, to hear about the naming of the Fine Arts uh, Music Center for our very dear friend, Ann Dean Turk. She is a lady who has given so tremendously of herself, of her knowledge, to her students. She exemplifies in every way part of the ancient tradition 
of knowing that a teacher is a guide. Because in the ultimate reality, every one of us must find his and her knowledge. Because for knowledge to be indelible, for it to be a permanent direction, we must have had those thoughtful guides to show us in where it is possible to find the knowledge. Education begins from the time we are born. And we are entrusted by a gracious Lord to thoughtful and caring parents. And because I have lived here, because time has never taken me away from here, I know all of you very well. And whether I was remarking with Ella Bean about her sweet mother, Mrs. Borders, or talking to Jewel Marie Dahl about Harold and his beautiful letters, which I'm so grateful for. Or whether, as it was in the summer of 1950, was the first time that all of us as young people at Kilgore High School were touched by a contemporary that seemed to have attracted the death angel. On a very warm day, my mother got this phone call from Francis Gertz, who was that time one of the great guiding stars of the cultural life of Kilgore, Texas. And she said, real to be, Greg Criswell was found dead. And when we went to console that family, the grief was so great and the tragedy so vivid. And a few weeks later, I went to Kilgore Cemetery. And Kathleen and Jack Criswell had put a little marker. This young man was so fabulously talented, I shall never forget him. He won the debate championship. He was in the senior play, had the lead, Strange Bedfellows. It was a wonderful play. He was handsome, articulate, wonderful orator, with a charisma like a young Ronald Reagan or a young John Kennedy. None of us were concerned about how far he would go. We just only wanted to know what direction he would go. And when we went to the cemetery, I would, well, I was alone. And I went because his passing had made such a tremendous, tremendous impression upon me and on so many young people in our school. And I saw this marker, very simple. But you know, there is something so unbelievably grand about stark simplicity. And these few words said it all. Many hopes lie buried here. And I think about that so often. I shall always think about that. But Greg Criswell has been a catalyst for a lot of us. 
his zest for life, his noble spirit, his invincible nature. And then it makes us all realize that we have all lost the physical presence of someone, but in so many ways as we look back over this fabulous city of Kilgore, we realize that Leggett Krim is still here. We realize that Francis Gertz is still here. All of the Roy H. Laird, all of these wonderful heroes and heroines to whom we looked for guidance, strength, direction, help, because nothing is lost in spirit. That's why great classical music is so terribly important. It encompasses all of the seven disciplines, but it is unseen. And it is in the task of trying to make something unseen, architecturally tangible. It's a great task that every classical composer has and every classical musician has to try to properly assimilate all of those notes to make them come to life for the listener. Our parents and our friends and our teachers can give us encouragement. That summer of 1950 passed. And starting the school year, which was to be my last year in high school, 1950-51, I graduated in 1951. Through the kindness of my sweet friend, Joyce Ann Goyne Stanley, she sent me because she was the editor-in-chief of the yearbook, and Shirley Jeter was the editor of the Mirror, and little Van was the editorial editor. But I enjoyed my journalism class under Miss Gertrude Locke. She was a dynamic teacher. And Margaret Williams was my English teacher for that senior year. And Mrs. Jessie Armstrong was that kind of indomitable teacher that you have around and always encouraging. And I remember so vividly my first grade, Mrs. Tom Gray, Olita Gray. We lived in a modest home on South Martin, but my parents loved it because it was really tandem to the schoolyard of Kilgore Heights Elementary School. And I can remember my mother saying, oh, Daddy, now this would be nice. This house is perfect because little Van will not have to do anything but just go out through the fence. He'll get to school. So we had moved from Shreveport, and my father was an employee of Magnolia Petroleum. And it had already been and by that time, in 1940, December, it had already been 10 years since the Daisy Bradford number three had changed the world. But the interesting part about Kilgore, as I have remarked to friends wherever I go, Charles and Lyde Duvall had created this marvelous saying on the masthead of the Kilgore News Herald, Kilgore, the capital of the world's largest oil field. And it was. No, this was the first. A great many people, yes, received some prosperity. But what I've always been so impressed with, they all treated it as if they had always had it. 
because they were rich in spirit, rich in mind. Their thoughts were grand. So when the prosperity and the largesse appeared in tangible degrees, it meant only to the proportion that it truly is, it is only a means of exchange and it is not the ultimate. The ultimate is the human heart, the beauty of the human soul, and the spirit of a city. Now they faced the incredible task of turning and transforming mere money into a dream and a reality. And knowing these people and their civic mindedness here in Kilgore, it is not a surprise nor a shock that you would have W.L. Dodson leading excellence in education, starting in 1935 with the foundation of a Kilgore College. Pride, it was pride the people in the city of Kilgore had. They wanted education to be a pinnacle of their great success. So also people probably forget that at one point the Kilgore Independent School District, of course with its prosperity, was perhaps the richest and most highly endowed public school system in America. And for that I, I think I was singularly blessed to have gone through public schools here. And the spirit of all those teachers, from my first grade teacher, Mrs. Gray, my fourth grade teacher, Alice Morton, the principal of Kilgore Heights Elementary School, Mr. McDavid, on through, I know I'll forget, Mildred Russell, oh my, there's so many, D.W. Weeks. But for all of those incredible teachers to inspire and to make you aspire to excellence gives an energy. My last year in high school, going back to this other, where, from which I digressed, Joyce Ann had sent me the school newspaper and as you are familiar, the school newspaper comes out every six weeks. So the first six weeks, we were facing our first edition. And if you will forgive, I was struck by having seen them and have not having seen them all this time. I was struck by the fact that so many times when we go through life at certain phases of our lives, we think one way. And we'll look back and we say, well, I really didn't mean that. I mean now for it to be so and so, and I think differently now. Well, you know, it's an incredible thing. I was 16, and I still think these thoughts. So with your permission, I'll read a little bit of the editorial that I wrote about the natural challenge of a school. Since we are on the campus of Kilgore College, we will be using Kilgore High School as the subject matter. What is a school? A set of rooms inhabited daily by anxious pupils? Or is it a group of teachers stamped with rules and regulations? Let us think what the great lives and ideas of the previous century had to do with the establishment of a system of education whereby individuals are privileged to obtain the knowledge of certain important topics plus psychological facts about human nature drawn through daily association. 
They of the 19th century understood and appreciated the fact that mastery of the ultimate appeal of the universe, knowledge, stands as it should always in the category of supreme importance. We, the students of Kilgore High School, realize the need for cooperation in all the phases of our varied school activities. Also, our attentions are warranted to the betterment of our contacts in this wide world of professions, successes, and opportunities. It is not the courses offered, the instructors, or the symbolic edifices that comprise a great school. It is the students and their wholehearted enthusiasm, ideals, and devotion. Destiny, the intrigue of life, the suspense of living, develops in uncertain ways with contours, rigid and bold. Along its many avenues, the stumbling blocks are numerous. Its highway signs are the impressions of our lives. How we utilize our opportunities and how we profit by our experiences, successes, or failures during the impressionable stage lead to the determination of our futures, hence our destinies. Everyone is endowed with some special gift in the many fields of beckoning opportunity which by means of development will contribute greatly to the world of tomorrow. There is at least one thing that everyone can take pride in and do better than anyone else and that is the only thing that makes life bearable and living what it is. Our predecessors have left their footprints of invaluable inspiration upon which we might build a greater world security. Can we forsake a heritage contrived by the tears, lives, and ambitions of those who have gone before? If we could but awake from this stupor of listlessness to the realization, and don't forget this was October of 1950, that as we stand on the threshold of this new era, the atomic age, now progress, we are beyond that. We are the heirs presumptive of the leaderships and vast possibilities which more prominently present themselves as time goes on. Today, we are six weeks nearer our aspired destinations, six weeks nearer the end of time. What have we accomplished? Well, I still feel that way. I'm still trying to wonder, oh, if I have a little more time, I certainly want to accomplish this. That was the kind of spirit that was given in my education from Kilgore High School and my brief time at Kilgore College. It gives you energy. The oil gave us energy. And how correctly the series, which this is an inaugural, should be called the Enrichment Series. It's an incredible fact about life, each day, how much we all yearn to be renewed to be further enriched by a smile, by kindness, by the human qualities that we also cherish. This tonight has just been such an extraordinary experience. They told me that I really could come for a visit and in so many ways, I feel it's been just that. While I know it's been a monologue, 
I have the prescience and the insight to your personalities. So I have tuned in to the love, the great stream of love that you have given to my mother and me this evening. I was supposed to have talked about the public library. <laughs> I had really a very detailed agenda. Bill Holder had told me, now you must tell two or three stories. Well, of course, one of the things I have bragged about so much, the fabulous Alien Skinner organ at Presbyterian Church, which was given by the Rogers Lacey family. Their thoughtfulness in giving a town a beautiful instrument was absolutely breathtaking because when I went to New York and they would say, have you, well, you know, there's this fabulous organist, Marcel Dupre in Paris, but I said, I heard him. Where did you hear him? I heard him in Kilgore, Texas. There wasn't any great organist that Roy Perry, the organist choir master, and Ella Bean, who took charge when he went to the World War II, there wasn't any great organist that did not come to Kilgore. The other story Bill Holder told me, he said, you know, you must tell a story about when your father had a timely visit with his son, I was age 12 or 13, to give me the facts of life. And he started out and he said, Sonny boy, the way you spell depletion allowance I do appreciate your having honored my mother and my father. He was a wonderful father. And every day something comes up when I see his, his life and his light, and they brighten corners of our lives. And I know he would be so thrilled as he was very, very devoted to my mother and to me. As a matter of fact, the memory, the last thing he was able to talk before he passed away when he said, hello, sonny boy, and I will always be his sonny boy. So I know he is just so thrilled as he's smiling down and thinking, oh, how nice. He used to say to me, he said, you know, sonny boy, Mother is wonderful. And I said, oh, yes, Daddy. He said, you know what? She's our life raft, and we're just hanging on. <laughs> the public library, as I told you, was mentioned in Compton's encyclopedia in the 1938 edition. That was another thing I was supposed to say. <laughs> and the excellence that you can... be privileged to avail yourselves, whether it be students, parents, teachers, or the like, at Kilgore College, truly a beacon. And my mother and I are looking forward to coming back here on October the 3rd of 1990 for the 60th anniversary of the Daisy Bradford Three and the 10th anniversary of this exquisite East Texas Oil Museum. I have told my friends about this and just before we left, I talked to Margaret Hunt Hill who extended her greetings to all of you tonight and she, on behalf of her dear father, H.L. Hunt, we're looking forward to being here on October the third of 1990. And I hope that you don't think I have rambled on because 
I was so stunned by this lovely program, the introductory remarks, and the great nostalgia that it gave me. The arts are really so important, and they will be increasingly important in the days of tomorrow. We only have a few more days of the decade of the 80s. I can't believe that they have flown by. But we have the 90s, which can really be so hopeful. I suppose never before in the history of our world have we found such varied multitude of things and events and people in which we can be optimistic and be very hopeful. We can also know that with optimism, it will take our genuine prayers to see that all the emerging leaders of each country in this world will be thoughtful and make the wise decisions for their people. But isn't that true in everything that we do in life? We pray that God will give us the strength and the wisdom to know what to do at the right time. So we're so grateful that people are being helped and they are having a spirit of optimism. I got a letter from a young man from the Soviet Union, composer and pianist, and he was writing to tell me how God was so kind and smiling on his country and how hopeful they were that the Lord would direct the paths of their leader, President Gorbachev. And I thought, oh, how wonderful. Last Sunday night, my mother and I were in Washington for the County Center Honors. And one of the honorees was William Schumann, who was the president of the Juilliard School. It was a lovely evening, and that Kennedy Center Honors program is such an interesting, varied program. At the very end, they had the Red Army Chorus. In the back of the stage, the American flag and the Soviet flag were in relief, side by side. And I shall never forget they sang one song, and then they sang in very understandable English, God bless America. It was so touching. And I thought, there really is hope in this world. And yes, while we do pray that God will bless America, we also will be double, doubly benefited if he will bless every nation on earth because each nation will have so much to give and share with each other. Thank you so much for this evening. You've inspired me. You have given me an indelible gift, your love.